is one of the many patients who go into the operating theater every day. From the moment that he is taken into the anesthetic room until he wakes in the ward, it's up to all those who come into contact with him to take charge of his well-being. The patient is frequently upset by neglect of small details of procedure which are less noticeable than the grosser defects of anesthetic technique. Here, collected together, are many such errors. Fear has an important effect on the course of anesthesia. Many patients are nervous in spite of preoperative medication. They should never be left alone. Without the reassuring presence of a nurse, the unfamiliar apparatus in the anesthetic room is very likely to increase their fears. Quiet is an important factor. Any disturbance places an additional strain on the patient. This anesthetic room is being used as a corridor and also as a storeroom for instruments needed elsewhere. On her return, the nurse appears to have not the slightest interest in the case. The anesthetist also has no time for even a few words with the patient. These would have done much to reassure her. The anaesthetist begins now to check over his machine. This should have been done before. Time is wasted changing cylinders and fetching instruments. To the patient, highly sensitive to noise and unable to see all that's going on, these sounds are very alarming. The doors of the anesthetic room have been left open and her growing fears are not relieved by the sight of a surgeon instructing his students in the finer points of his last operation. Again, the anesthetic room appears to provide a convenient corridor. But the anesthetist is too busy filling his ether jar to pay any attention to such details. A strong smell of spilt ether has now added to the patient's discomfort. Without washing his hands or glancing at the patient's chart, the anaesthetist begins induction. The mask is put onto the patient's face with no warning. Almost immediately, the nurse removes the blanket in order to cut the bandages. To the semi-conscious patient, it appears that the operation is about to begin, and she struggles violently. At the first sign of movement, the porter has rushed in. He and the nurse fling themselves on the wretched patient. The anaesthetist, meanwhile, loses control of the mask. At last she is quiet, but by this time everyone, including the patient, is warm and sweating. While induction proceeds to the satisfaction of the anaesthetist, the patient is left with her knees drawn up. As anesthesia deepens, her limbs relax, her knees fall over sideways, almost dragging her from the trolley to the ground. In putting her back, no one notices her arm slip out of the coverings and hang down over the edge of the trolley. Despite all these mishaps, the anaesthetist makes no attempt to check the position of the patient on the trolley before going into the theater. During the previous struggle, her elbow was left sticking out over the side. 
This catches against the door as they pass. When the patient is in the theater, her head falls back as she is lifted because the canvas of the stretcher doesn't come far enough up to support it. Fortunately, the nurse notices the patient's arm in time to save it from being crushed against the edge of the table. All this delay and the fact that the anaesthetist has needlessly removed the mask means that the patient will now have reached very light anesthesia. As you would have realized, all the mistakes shown here were very simple and could have been avoided. This is how it should have been done. The patient is brought into the anaesthetic room by a porter and a nurse from the ward. The nurse goes off to put on her gown and mask, leaving the patient in the care of the anaesthetic room nurse. In hospitals where such staff is not available, the porter must remain, as on no account should the patient be left alone. When the ward nurse returns, she removes the patient's head shawl and loosens the clothing round his throat. If necessary, she also cuts any bandages round the neck. Everything is now ready for the anaesthetist. On entering, he closes the doors carefully behind him and says a few words to the patient. A reassuring explanation of what is about to take place will gain his confidence and ensure his cooperation. The anaesthetist should make it a part of his routine to look at the chart and check the details of the patient's condition and of the premedication. Before beginning the induction, he sniffs the mask to make sure that the right anesthetic vapor is coming through and inspects the mouth for false or loose teeth. At the same time, the nurse can reassure the patient by holding his hand. She keeps up a slight movement of her thumb. If the hand is held motionless, the sensation becomes blunted and the feeling of reassurance is lost. In the event of struggling, the anaesthetist never loses control of the mask. If restraint has to be applied, it should be just enough to prevent damage to the patient and to those around him, and no more. Ideally, two attendants should be present, but when only one is available, violent struggling should be restrained by catching the wrists, holding the arms to the side, and leaning across the trolley at the level of the patient's thighs. The drumming of the heels on the trolley may cause severe bruising unless it's quickly checked. When induction has reached the stage of true surgical anesthesia, the nurse may cut the bandages, leaving the sterile dressing in place. The coverings are then put back. The patient is now ready. The anaesthetist looks on either side to make sure that the patient is properly placed on the trolley and then gives the word to go into the theatre. On arrival at the side of the table, the anaesthetist assures himself that the canvas comes up well under the patient's head. He is then gently lifted onto the table. The common position of the patient on the operating table is lying on the back with the arms placed along the sides and the head slightly raised on a flat pillow and turned a little to one side clenched hands may result in gangrene. 
so the fingers must be straightened and any rings should already have been removed before the hands are placed under the buttocks. This is enough to keep the arms in position with the elbows close to the sides throughout the operation. Some anaesthetists prefer to use cuffs fastened to the side of the table. If the cuffs are slack, however, the elbows may slip over the edge. Another method is to use a towel laid across the table under the patient. The ends are brought round the forearms and hands and tucked in. No matter what method is used to keep the patient's arms to his sides, it is essential to see that they are secure. If an arm should slip out during the course of the operation, the muscular spiral nerve might be compressed between the humerus and the edge of the table and lead to paralysis. Alternatively, the arms may be placed on the patient's chest, either crossing them over or placing the hands one on top of the other. The theater gown is then turned back to enclose the arms and the ends are tucked under. During anesthesia, the normal heat regulating mechanisms are affected and warmth is essential in the care of the patient. Spare blankets should be placed on the warm pipes of the radiator ready for the return to the ward. Some hospitals are fitted with heated cupboards for this purpose. The theater temperature should be at about 75 degrees Fahrenheit in abdominal operations or where there is a large area of body exposed. The patient's coverings also are important. Small rubber sheets should be used as large ones encourage fluid loss by sweating. During the operation, as much of the patient's body and limbs must be kept covered with light blankets or towels as is possible without impeding the surgeon. A bald man can lose a lot of heat from his head alone, and a shawl will do much to prevent this. In most cases, the patient's eyes close automatically during anesthesia. If the eyes remain open, the lids should be closed every few minutes to moisten the cornea. Great care must be taken to make certain that the eyes are shut every time the mask is removed or replaced. Rubbing the exposed eye with ether-soaked gauze gives rise to that painful condition known as anesthetic eye. In the same way, make sure that the eyes are shut before putting on towels. In deep anesthesia, when tear formation is reduced, a drop of liquid paraffin may be instilled into the eyes to prevent dryness. Some anaesthetists use this or a thick layer of sterile Vaseline in all cases. The maintenance of a free airway is an essential of anesthesia. Don't forget that apart from gross respiratory obstruction, there may be minor hindrances to the breathing that can pass unnoticed until serious complications have set in. Here, for example, the anaesthetist has realized that the breathing is unsatisfactory, as shown by diminished movement of the rebreathing bag. It may be due to a tired or a too eager assistant leaning on the patient's chest. The use of a retractor under the liver or diaphragm may embarrass the breathing. Trauma in the region of the diaphragm is a contributory factor to the development of post-operative collapse of the lung. The good assistant will not continue to exert pressure unless it's really helping in the performance of the operation. The gradual accumulation of unwanted instruments on the patient's chest is an added burden. The anaesthetist should call attention to these 
and ask for them to be removed. Under anesthesia, the vasomotor system cannot compensate for sudden change of posture. Any alteration of position must be done gently and smoothly and should be supervised by the anaesthetist. Rough handling while putting on an abdominal binder may result in a serious fall in blood pressure. This is particularly true at the end of a long operation. During recovery, the vomiting reflex is active as the patient returns to the second stage of anesthesia. The skilled anesthetist will make sure that this point doesn't occur while the patient is on the way back to bed. He can either allow anesthesia to lighten so much that the stage of reflex vomiting has passed before the patient leaves the table, or, as here, he keeps him sufficiently under to make vomiting unlikely before he is returned to the ward. The nurse now puts the warm blankets over the patient and a warm shawl around his head. The face should be uncovered so that it's easy to tell at a glance that the patient's breathing is clear. Take care when replacing the poles in the canvas stretcher that they don't strike the elbows or any other part of the body. Before handing over to the nurse, it's the anaesthetist's duty to see that the general condition of the patient is satisfactory and to point out the importance of maintaining a good airway. During the journey back to the ward, the nurse and porter are responsible for maintaining that airway. To do this satisfactorily, they must be able to recognize the difference between obstructed and unobstructed breathing. In this case, for example, the patient appears to be breathing as all the accessory muscles are at work in an effort to draw breath in, but no air is entering his lungs. It's essential that the attendant does not confuse this with free breathing and relax his watch on the patient. He should support the jaw and this will usually relieve the obstruction. In this case, on the other hand, although the airway is unobstructed, the patient's breathing has become shallow and the porter is alarmed and goes off for help leaving the patient by herself. In fact, the breathing, though shallow, is adequate, and the patient's color is satisfactory. The correct first aid treatment in any doubtful case is proper support of the jaw. In the ward, the bed is ready for the return of the patient. The blankets are taken off, while the sister turns back the bedclothes and removes any hot water bottles from the bed. Whether two or three assistants are used for lifting, the essential point is that the head and shoulders, pelvis and legs must be supported at the same time. The lifting is done from the same side and the patient is gently transferred to the bed where he is immediately covered with a light blanket. When the hot water bottles are to be put back, there should be at least one blanket between them and the patient. A tray of instruments should be at the head of the bed. This includes a gag, tongue depressor, and 
swab holder. The use of any kind of tongue clip is to be avoided, as these tend to cause trauma. So long as the patient is a good color, both his respiratory and cardiovascular systems are working efficiently. Until consciousness returns, he must be constantly watched to see that the respiration is free and unobstructed, and to note the character and rate of the pulse. After an operation on the nose, mouth or throat, in which there is a possibility of blood entering the pharynx and being inhaled, the patient must return from the theater, lying on his side with the legs drawn up and the shoulder well over. Make certain that an arm or knee is not hanging over the edge of the trolley. is put back to bed, still on his side, lying semi-prone with the uppermost leg drawn well up. A pillow is placed behind the shoulder to stop him rolling back. In this position, any blood will trickle into the cheek. In addition to the usual watch on the respiration and pulse, care must be taken to see that such blood is spat out and not swallowed unnoticed. This is especially important after tonsillectomy in children, in whom the effects of hemorrhage are sudden and severe. In patients in whom hemorrhage is not likely to occur, vomiting may present its own problems. Although the anaesthetist will have done his best to prevent post-operative vomiting, it's not always avoidable. The nurse should therefore be ready to deal with it. A suitable receptacle is presented and the head held over to one side. In most cases, this is all that's necessary. But sometimes the vomiting is accompanied by breath holding and clenching of the jaw, conditions which lead up to the inhalation of vomitus then the gag has to be used. Inhalation of vomitus is a very serious complication which may bring on pneumonia or abscess of the lung. By inserting the gag, as soon as breath holding is noticed, the jaw is forced open ready for the critical moment and any possible danger is averted. Where the gag cannot be placed between the clenched teeth, the jaw must first be forced open by a wooden wedge. Frequently, a patient returns from the theater with an artificial airway in place. This should not be taken out until she appears to object to its presence by coughing or endeavoring to remove it herself. Patients recovering from barbiturates may be restless and excitable. It's unwise to give morphine at this stage. They will usually respond if they are told to lie down and are encouraged to go to sleep. The patient must not be left alone until tone has returned to the muscles of the throat and he can maintain his own airway. After that, the average patient can be left for a few moments. But a close watch must still be kept until he shows signs of returning consciousness.